talking about me, but in a way I will. Um, so I want to tell you the story of how I started uh, working on these issues. Uh, because I started in 2018 and I've been introduced as a uh, computer scientist and a sociologist, which is correct, formally correct. But I am first and foremost a sociologist. And back then in 2018, I was even more a sociologist. I was just a sociologist. And not only that, I was the only sociologist in my group, a group of computer scientists which, as you can imagine, was a challenge. And this is why I thought I would bring up this story here, because I can imagine that being this a, um, an interdisciplinary center, you face some of the same challenges. But also, um, I don't know, the, the nice things about, um, about interdisciplinarity. So this is why I thought I would start with this. So when I started in 2018, again, I, was, I joined this group called uh, Criticality of AI Systems at the Vitamom Institute. And I had never done anything related to, to technology. I had never studied anything related to technology specifically. I will never know how I got that job, to be honest. But uh, the thing is, I did, I got it. And for months, I tried to <laughs> grapple with the idea of studying AI. I didn't know what that was, what that did, what I was supposed to be knowing or researching about that. Uh, it was very hard for me to, to find an entry point into that. I, I saw my, the group and I was, I could imagine or I could already, I was realizing that they wanted to do nice things, uh, that they were not just, you know, techno solutionists trying to create something just for the sake of creating technology just because it was technically possible, but they really wanted to think of the societal consequences of what they were creating. They had other questions uh, that I found interesting. So there was uh, someone there um, working on furnace metrics, someone working, of course, on bias mitigation tools, someone working on explainability techniques. And again, I didn't have an entry point. I didn't know what those were, and I was really struggling until I realized that all those things were not really accessible to me because those were they were studying artifacts. They were studying metrics, tools, techniques, number, uh, numbers, formula. Um, and I needed to look at these things as a sociologist. I needed to look at these things from another point of view. And that point of view was to really look at the humans and the social relationships behind these technologies and these things and these artifacts. So this is how I started thinking of the work that goes into creating AI technologies and specifically of data work. And by the way, when I talk of data work in this talk, I will be referring to things that you might know as crowd work, crowdsourcing. Um, um, yeah, uh, ghost work has also been called micro work and so on. So that's just to establish that, that I have a little bit of a, of a problem with each one of those terms. So I will refer to that as data work, but again, I'm referring to the same thing that you know as crowd, crowd work or other synonyms to that. So when I started uh, studying this, I started with questions like, who are the data workers? Who are the people creating the data sets that train and validate and perfect uh, AI technologies? Who, uh, what are the relationships of those data workers with the rest of the AI supply chain? Where does data work uh, happen? Who are the, what are the places? What are the structures? And in a way, this is why I, I wanted to start with this illustration here. That's, uh, that's part of a series called The Future is Here by the artist Mimi Unoha. And in this series, Mimi uh, portrays the places in which data work happens, happen. Um, and those places are in a way so far away from the imaginary that we have from uh, what tech work is and how tech work happens. When we think of tech work, we tend to think of a fancy setup with three screens somewhere in Silicon Valley in a very fancy um, office. Whereas data work takes place in places like that, in very intimate places, very small devices, uh, in, in someone's room, next to their bed, in someone's kitchen, uh, where their families are around. And uh, this is what Mimi tries to show, and this is also what I find found in my research, and I very much uh, 
can relate to that. Um, and also, those places are not only far away from our imaginary of tech work, uh, in, in the sense that, in, in, this, in, in, in an aesthetic sense, but they are also very far away in, in geographical terms. And in this slide, you can see the, speaking of uh, remote geographies, the various places and perspectives that I, uh, that I approached in the past five years here, we have a little bit of the newest project meeting in which uh, I am working with communities of data workers in Europe. But what I uh, did already is uh, work with data workers in Argentina and Bulgaria and Syria, in Venezuela, different places of the world. With them, uh, I did uh, interviews, I did um, workshops, document uh, and interface analysis, observations, surveys, and whatnot. So many things happened in the past five years. So when I talk about data work, uh, again, I refer to what you might know as crowd work, um, but specifically I refer to these four groups of tasks. Um, and this is, a, this is a classification that I find very useful. It's not mine. This is by the colleagues Paula Tubaro um, and Antonio Casilli. Um, and they make the separation that, again, I find very useful to explain what it is, what data work is and what are the tasks. So the first one has to do with data generation. They call it data entry. I find that a little bit of an understatement to, for what this really is. It is uh, data generation. And when we talk about data generation, um, it can be, it can consist of scraping things from the internet, data that is publicly available. But in many cases, it is about workers producing the data with their own bodies. Really, like as you see here, uploading this example, upload a picture of a document with your prescription value. So your glasses, uh, the prescription that you get, upload that document. Um, I've seen many cases in which the workers are asked, and this is very common, uh, asked to upload selfies of themselves to enrich uh, facial um, data sets or to upload pictures of their family members, their friends, their kids even, um, or cases in which they are asked to upload images of rooms in their own homes or objects uh, or record uh, their voices reading text passages. So really producing the data with their own bodies and also with their labor. The second type of task, annotation or labeling, is about interpreting and classifying data. So imagine a, a data set composed of images and you, there are workers really classifying First of all, segmenting in most cases, segmenting what it appears in the image and then adding labels according to or saying what is what. Or in this case, the case on, on the slide, um, where workers are to classify text passages in terms of appropriate or not appropriate or sexually explicit, suggestive um, and non-sexual. I keep on forgetting that I can read here. I'm doing, making a huge effort trying to read there <laughs> when I could be reading here. Um, so uh, yeah, that's data labeling or annotation. And then you have tasks that have to do with algorithmic verification, which is, um, I don't know, imagine when you watch a movie on Netflix and then uh, Netflix asks you, was that, uh, they suggest you something to watch next, and then they ask you, what uh, was that um, was that suggestion useful, um, or was that appropriate, or did you like that? So that's algorithmic verification, but this work, and this is, this is a lot of that is done by users like you and I, by the way, and that's unpaid labor, this, in the same way that unpaid data, data labor, labor is whenever we are asked to solve a recapture quiz online, that's also unpaid data labor. Uh, data labor. Uh, but in this case, workers do that type of work at scale. They are presented with, for example, uh, results from a search engine, and they are asked to classify those results in terms of whether that's uh, useful or unuseful, related, unrelated, appropriate, not appropriate, and so on. And finally, the fourth task is the one that um, most of the people don't imagine exists, that is called AI impersonation, as in people, actual workers pretending to be AI systems. And there's a lot of that that's not just something that is um, uh, 
only in cases where a system breaks down or only in cases, there is a lot of that and there is a lot of that that is permanent. So um, that happens, for example, as in this case where workers are instructed to respond to a user's query pretending to be chatbots with yes or no answers or with, you know, like a drop down menu uh, type of answer. Um, or as Antonio Casilli has also uh, talked about this, has also made this observation in Madagascar, and I've made the, the same observation in Syria where workers uh, are supposed, or sorry, the other way around, where there, you, there, there is supposed to be a smart camera, camera that is powered by AI technologies, and actually what's behind the camera is a bunch of workers somewhere in Madagascar or in Syria monitoring uh, screens 24-7, a bunch of workers who are, by the way, underpaid and not really recognized as uh, being part of the system. And data work has been on the news lately, probably, or maybe you've read this. This uh, data work made the cover of the Time magazine two months ago, I think, with this story in which they report about the labor conditions of the data workers who helped um, um, train ChatGPT or GPT in general. So it turns out that OpenAI, uh, before the release of ChatGPT, was uh, worried about it not outputting uh, overly, um, overly uh, toxic or discriminatory material uh, uh, results, not being overly uh, aggressive or uh, sexist or, or racist. And they were worried about that a, because um, as you know, GPT is trained on uh, text snippets from the internet and the internet is a wonderful place that can also be a toxic one. It contains anything that is worse, that is good and that is worse uh, about humanity. So uh, that, was, that was why they were worried, but they were also worried because nowadays you cannot bring out a product that outputs um, results that are overtly uh, discriminatory. You cannot do that because the shitstorm that that would cause, the, pub, the public scrutiny that that would cause, would force or has forced already many companies to, uh, having to uh, withdraw their products out of the market because of that. So it is important to be mindful of those things nowadays, nowadays and to um, yeah uh, take care of that early on in the process. So what they did, what needed to be done is to actually separate the acceptable type of material from the toxic one. So they needed to work on text snippets that were that were toxic, toxic, and the ones that could be okay to perfect the uh, the GPT. And that need, needed to be done per hand. That needed to be done by workers. And of course, the engineers in San Francisco, the OpenAI engineers in San Francisco, were not going to do that because the task included being confronted with the material that you see on screen. Child sexual abuse, bestiality, murder, suicide, torture, self-harm, incest, and anything what is terrible in this world. So you, workers need to be confronted with that, this is not a nice task. This is a terrible thing to go through as a worker. So again, engineers in Silicon Valley were not going to do that. And even if they were uh, uh, willing to do that, the cost of paying them to do that would have been, would have taken OpenAI to bankruptcy. So what did OpenAI do? It outsourced the task. It still needed to be done. So who can do that? Well, people who don't have another option. So it, OpenAI outsourced the task through a partner company called Zama, and it sent it to Kenyan workers. Kenyan workers were the one confronted with the material that you see on slide. Kenyan workers were the one who uh, took care of that. And not only that, but they put them to work under not so nice labor conditions, paid them less than $2 an hour, um, and after they were confronted with all that terrible material and after they were um, scarred probably for life from having to watch that, neither OpenAI nor Zama, the company in Kenya, offered them um, psychological support. So this is, uh, I had so beautiful, um, uh, animations to create suspense. So now I cannot create any more suspense. So um, 
we um, this is of course a matter of AI ethics. This is, I think, the most obvious part. This is uh, a matter of AI ethics in the sense of not only caring for the results of uh, machine learning systems and for the outputs and for the bias and so on, but also caring for our fellow workers who are less fortunate than we are, even though they are somewhere in Kenya or in Syria and we don't get to see them. Um, this is about being good people. But the other point is, this is also about data quality. And this is the point that I want to make or, to, or this is the part that I want to brainstorm with all of you today. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit later. But first, let's go back to, to data work and how it's structured. So tech companies of all sizes, from the, uh, from the tech giants in Silicon Valley to smaller startups, also research organizations, universities, um, research institutes, they all need data, some to market their products, some to advance machine learning uh, research or AI research, but they all need data and they need that at scale. And so many of them outsource these type of tasks. They outsource the production of data sets um, and they outsource them through platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk. You may know that, and this is also why on this meme, there's a reference to the Mechanical Turkers. Those are the workers uh, at Amazon Mechanical Turk. There are many other platforms like uh, App and Prolific and so on. Or they do that through companies, specialized companies such as Sama that I just mentioned in Kenya or many others. For example, the companies that I work with uh, or where I did field work in Bulgaria and in Argentina, they are companies that are very, very similar to Sama um, in their structure. When I say that this type of work, that data work is outsourced, I mean that it is not done in the same organizations where the development of the models happen. Um, sometimes it is not even done in the same countries as the places where the, model, uh, the models are developed. And already this, this might sound very counterintuitive to think that two types of work were, that are so intrinsically connected with each other, the work of the modelers and the work of the data workers, that they happen in different places. This is already something that should call our attention because it's something that, to me, doesn't make sense at all. Unless there are economic imperatives to do so, which is probably the case. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that both types of work, the work of the modelers and the work of the, of the data workers, are regarded in different ways. They are not just separated in physical terms, but also in the imaginaries that we have from the whole type of work, uh, of work they are regarded, regarded differently. Whereas the work of the modelers is glamorized in the sense that we tend to talk about the genius engineer in Silicon Valley that developed this or that algorithm. When we talk about data work or when data work is discursivized, we talk about low-skilled workers, who are doing repetitive type of tasks, which are a no brainer at all, because it's just, you know, marking something, labeling something. Um, we talk, of, there's reports that uh, with the title called something like uh, the blue collar job of the 21st century. So we try, so it's always, you know, this type of underselling of what this type of work really is, when the reality is that without this type, these, these data workers, we wouldn't have the models that we have, the, we wouldn't have the data sets at scale that we have so uh, right now. So, and therefore we wouldn't have the model, the large models that we see today and that there is so much hype around. So I said before, the requesters are research organizations, are companies, uh, but I have to make clear here that not every company and not every research organization is in a position in which they could actually um, request data work. So here on this map, you see, I hope you can see it, uh, you see in blue the, um, the buyers, so the, the clients, the requesters, and in red, the vendors, so the, the data workers actually. So if we look at the blue dots, we see a concentration in North America, of course, US, of course, Canada a little bit, we see a concentration here in Central and Northern Europe. But if we start looking at the red dots, we see that we start looking down towards the South and especially towards the East. 
So as you can imagine here from this uh, geographical uh, distribution, uh, outsourcing this task is considerably cheaper and faster than having them done in-house. And this is why this nonsense of having these type of works uh, separated prevail. Um, and why is it cheaper? Well, that's because when outsourced, data work happens under very precarious conditions in which the workers are paid per task. They are not paid per hour, per month, per week or per year. They are paid per task and ta tasks are, each task is very different from the other one. So it turns out that they never know how much they will earn. They will never know if what they will earn will be enough to feed themselves or their families. Also, it pays per task and it pays only a few cents per task. It is not that for every task you get enough that you, well, you can just, um, yeah, relax until the next, the next task comes. There are many things that are unpaid, like looking for the task, reading the instructions, understanding the instructions. There are many, many things that are, um, yeah, in a way unpaid. Um, and the, the take time is unpaid time and labor. Um, and it's also outsourcing, it's also cheaper because when outsourced, as you might already guess from this uh, map, uh, when outsourced, it is outsourced to communities or to regions of the world that are very poor, where, um, where unemployment rates are high, places that are ridden by war, by economic crisis, and so on. Um, and even in those places, even in those places that are going through uh, historical or are victim of historical inequalities, to put it in a way, even in those places, these companies such as Sama and the platforms, they target especially vulnerable communities, even in those places. So, for example, Sama would put their hats in rural Kenya, not in the big center or urban centers. So they would put, go to places where there is no other alternative than to work for that. And if you ask the workers, they would tell you, yeah, of course, having a job is better than having no job. And this job is better than, than other alternatives. So this is why I'm just, I'm just doing this. The company in Buenos Aires that where I did field work, they would go and actively look for workers in the slums of the outskirts of Buenos Aires. As in, they would go to the slum, they would um, create an event in which they would do some sort of uh, free of cost class of, to learn digital um, uh, skills or English or something. And then they would invite people who didn't have, who don't have a possibility to get another education to this course. And then they would select their the workers. The company in Bulgaria, they worked with uh, refugees from the Middle East and they would actively go and look for the workers at the refugee camps. And I'm not really blaming those companies because again the workers they say well this is a good thing all of this is done in the name of bringing work to underserved communities to places where there are there is no work what i'm saying is that what we are often that are offering them or what they are offering them is just better than nothing but it's not better than other things that could be possible and it could be it could be done in a different way it could these workers could be offered a dignified salary. They could be offer, uh, offered dignified labor conditions. They are not right now. So the, what they earn at the platforms, what they earn uh, with these companies, it doesn't allow them to plan for the future. It doesn't allow them to send their kids to uh, university. It doesn't allow the people living in the slums to get out of the slum and rent a place somewhere uh, in the city. Um, it doesn't get them out of poverty, and that's the point. So. I think that's already from what we are discussing here, you can already guess that there is a huge power differential between requesters and, and workers. So already because of the, of, of the way they both are treated and both are regarded already because of what they earn, because of their location, because of their education, there is already a huge power differential between both. And the task instructions that are, um, that are given, that are, uh, produced by the work, for, sorry, by the requesters and given to the workers. They are generally documents, just like you see now on, on the screen. These are just PDFs that could vary from a one pager to uh, handbooks like with 80 pages or more. Right? Um, and 
they are um, the, the, the examples that I will show you, by the way, they are all part of a study that we did with Julian Posada um, two years ago, in which we analyzed more than 200 instructions, uh, instruction documents, again, of various uh, length. Um, and those instructions, they were all given to data workers in Venezuela and Argentina. And this is important because Venezuela and Argentina are two places in Latin America where the uh, language is Spanish. The instructions are in English, and this, they are not in English because I translated them for this talk. They, are, they were in English. That's the original. They were given in English to the workers. So not even that basic respect of giving instructions in the language that the workers could understand. So the first example, the first example you could see, it's a type of hate speech classification task with very basic binary uh, type of classification. So basically to say, yes, no, is this hate speech or not? which already leaves out a lot of gray areas in between, especially when we are talking about transcultural uh, uh, types of, um, uh, oh, what's the word, um, perception of what hate speech is or not. And there's here a description of what should be considered hate speech or not, that is supposed to be useful, but it's not. Uh, and it says that to consider something hate speech, it needs to be based on protected attributes. And it doesn't make clear here what is meant by protected attributes, but in all cases where protected attributes appear, it's supposed to mean a protected attributes according to US legislation, so to the law in the USA, which considers things like race, gender, religion, but it leaves out many other uh, yeah, uh, dimensions that could be important in other cultural contexts, such as caste, that could be very important to talk about hate speech and discrimination in places like Asia, or class, that is super important in Latin America. There is no reference to that. And this is a common problem, right? The classes and the attributes or the labels that are predefined, they are always predefined by the client. There is no instance that we found in which the workers are invited to participate in the co-creation of the labels. They are always predefined by the clients and they are always based on the cultural assumptions of the clients. They are never based in the cultural assumptions of the Venezuelan um, data worker. Um, the last example, the, the example below, it's a race uh, type of classification uh, for, in, for an image data set, for facial red data set. And as you can guess from the from the five categories that you see on the screen, this is also based on a racial classification type that might make sense in the US or not, uh, but it sure as hell doesn't make sense for the Latin American workers. And Julian and I had the chance to interview some of the workers after um, the workers that actually had interacted with these, um, with these uh, instructions, and uh, we had the chance to ask them what they thought about the instructions, and all of them would tell us, well, in many of the cases, in most of the cases, this doesn't make sense to me, but what can I do? I try to think what the requester would want. I try to think what does the requester want, and I do exactly that. It is not my place to question these, even though if they don't make sense. I remember very well um, a black Venezuelan man, uh, a data worker, who told us, well, if I had to classify myself according to these categories, I wouldn't know if I should put myself as African-American or Latino-Hispanic, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make sense in this context, but well, what can I do? I just, with experience, I've learned what the client expects and what, what kind of um, labels the client wants to be or how the client wants to have things done, and that's what I do. Okay, so maybe you're thinking now, okay, but there's the last um, category, ambiguous, and maybe you're thinking, well, that category might help us signalize that it is impossible to get someone's race from a picture. Let me disappoint you. The category ambiguous and any other residual categories that we found in the, in the instructions, they respond to this thing that you see in the middle, other, if there is no face in the box. So they are not there to signalize that there might be something beyond this narrow classification. They are not there to signalize that there are other genders other than male and female. They are only there to signalize that you cannot see the, that there's a problem with the file. That in, the, in all cases, it's the same. It's, 
Use other um, if the person is looking back. Use other if um, you cannot uh, see the, the face very well. Use other if the, the, the picture is blurry, if it's pixeled. Use other if the text snippet or the audio snippet cannot be is noisy or cannot you cannot hear it clearly, uh, or the file is damaged. Only for that are those uh, type of residual categories. And this and again in all those cases and in cases where the categories don't make sense, what prevails is thinking what the client wants. Um, and why and and why is that or or sorry or how could it be in a different manner if the each instruction contains this type of warning i would call this threat that if workers are not accurate or don't provide high quality responses they will be banned um, from the task or even from from the platform they will be out of work they will not be able to uh, make ends meet or feed their family and so on they will be out of work in places where there are no other alternatives and let me be very clear here. In all cases, in all instructions that we found, there is there was no um, neutral value for what accuracy means. There is not accuracy equals something. In all cases, accuracy, high quality, um, job well done means obeying the instructions, doing what the client instructed doing what the client wants. And if you cannot guess, or if you cannot uh, understand that from the instructions, well, you need to imagine what the, try to put yourself in the shoes of the client and do exactly that. Don't think for yourself. Think really as the client would want you to think. The interfaces even reinforce that type of imposition or that type of, of mindset, right? In which, as you see here, you have the predefined categories, um, that were in the instructions, they are already uploaded there, they are uh, there and the workers need to choose one of the categories, they cannot choose anything else. And here you have again the other category that is again for uh, images in which you cannot see the face of the person. And workers, data workers, I mean, they don't have uh, the rights to add, remove, change or anything around the classes and attributes as you see here. This is just an example, but it is, it is also true. Um, the only one who can do that is the project owner. Guess who the project owner is? The client. So the worker doesn't have any possibility to signalize that this data could be labeled or could be collected in a different way. And also, most of the platforms and most of the interfaces and the systems that are used for this type of work, they don't allow the possibility, they don't have a chat function, for example. They don't allow the possibility to, of workers communicating back, to, communicating back to the requesters. And if they do, they ask the client when you, you might know this, but when you put out a task, when you upload a task, you're asked, do you want to enable the chat function or not? So you get, get to choose. And even in cases in which there is a chat function, it is common knowledge among the workers that they believe that um, they shouldn't be using the chat function that they it is better if they don't communicate back to the requesters because otherwise they have the feeling that the algorithm will flag them as being whiny, as complaining. So they don't. They don't um, communicate back to the, they don't ask questions or question the, the task because they believe that that will result in their performance um, score being decreased um, and therefore they will not be hired for other tasks and so on. So instead, so <laughs> it, this was better with the animation. <laughs> um, so in sum, narrow instructions, uh, work interfaces, labor conditions uh, that are terrible. These were being done in places that places that this read are written uh, by economic crisis. Um, they all the, the, all those factors. They all ensure that this type of work is done according to the preferences of paying clients, that the workers remain obedient uh, in, a, in an implicit and normalized way. And I think that's the worst part of this, that this is all normalized. Nobody questions this, because why would you? Someone is the paying client, someone is the service provider. It's the basic of as old as capitalism. Who will question this? Um, there is a service relationship, someone is there to serve, and someone is there to be served. Why would you question that? 
But the problem is that this is not only about the labor conditions, this is about the truths that get encoded into the data sets and whose truths uh, get encoded into the data sets and reproduced by the systems. So instead of seeking the wisdom of crowds, as crowd work is uh, advertised and as was supposed the aim of crowd work in which you would find the middle ground or you would have, you know, like this uh, uh, search for, for consensus among the workers. What is done is imposing ways of interpreting data, of interpreting realities um, that are in most cases guided by on the one hand, economic imperatives, because again, it's cheaper, it's faster. Um, so the rationale is what is the cheapest way of producing this data? Uh, what is the fastest way at low cost? And it's also guided by, um, by technical possibilities of the requesters. So in mo I found that in most of the cases when I interview requesters, the rationale is what data, what kind of data and labels do I need to fit my model? I want my model to do this, so what is the data? So I want the data to fit my model and not the other way around. I have this data, what kind of knowledge can I extract from this data? Um, so, so we arrived to the first conclusion. Oh, I lost my notes. Yes. We are right to the first conclusion. How are asymmetries in data work fundamentally shape data and systems? Or in other words, whoever has enough money to pay for data workers has the right to impose their preferred classifications, their preferred truth on the data workers and through them, through their labor on the data sets and on systems. So power imbalances that are inherent to, again, um, uh, service relationships in capitalism, um, they not only shape labor relationships, they also shape data and systems. And this is the part that computer scientists should also be interested in, even if they are not uh, like me, also sociologists who's interested in the people and the labor relationships. Um, and this is why it's so important to talk about uh, labor in AI ethics. Uh, this is why it's so important to bring up this dimension. Um, because if we don't understand the political economy and the labor relationships that fuel this, uh, these systems, we will never fully understand these technologies. It is, and now I'm saying this as a computer scientist, it is pointless to talk about um, explainability techniques and transparency uh, mechanisms, because really our systems will remain black boxes. I'm talking about the black box as we talked about this 10 years ago. Uh, we will keep on having to talk about black boxes because we will never fully understand this, these systems if we don't talk about the humans and the economic relationships that shape the systems. However, my uh, research colleagues, my uh, fellow computer scientists, they have focused um, on the biases of data workers, regarding them as bias carrying hazards whose subjectivities are fundamentally detrimental, detrimental for the data. And these are just a few examples of that. Um, they have not really focused on looking at the bigger picture and the, um, and the structures that actually guide the ways in which data is labeled, the ways in which data is collected, the ways in which uh, data sets are produced. There has been a focus on the weakest link of the link of the chain, that is the, wor the data workers, instead of looking at what the requesters are imposing and so on. And the and from these paper titles, you might guess that the that the rationale here has been okay. Workers, data workers, are dangerous to the data, so therefore we need to constrain them even more. We need to create even more constraining interfaces even more, na even narrower uh, instructions, um, even more surveillance. So I don't need to tell you I have an issue with this type of research, first of all, because from a research ethics perspective, it is not good that we are uh, looking for more creative ways to narrow um, or to, to, to narrow someone's workers agency, uh, especially the agency of workers who are very much constraining their agency, uh, but also I have a practical, um, a practical uh, reason not to like this. And I don't like it because it doesn't work. As we have seen before, the biases 
that get encoded into the into the data sets are not those of the workers, not because the workers don't have biases. They are humans. Of course, they have preconception and bias, preconceptions and biases. But those that get encoded because of the way in, in which this type of work is structured are those of the of the requesters of the again elite uh, university professor or the the engineers in Silicon Valley. Those are the biases that get encoded in data sets. Nobody's studying that. So, also, in a way, aiming at studying or mitigating biases is, as the great Julia Poles and Helen Nisselbaum have put it, a seductive distraction, which means that it distracts us from addressing bigger issues, issues that have to do with the concentration of power in AI systems, with uh, predominant worldviews that get encoded in, in data sets from the hegemony of uh, global north, um, of, 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 you know, data sets origined in the global north that don't, don't, that don't really serve the majority of the world in a way. So, and this is, again, grasping this is fundamental for the AI ethics community. As I said before, this is really labor needs to um, needs to become a fundamental uh, dimension of AI uh, ethics. But instead, the AI ethics community has been distracted fighting data workers' biases, and then while well, they are distracted doing that, things like that story that I told you off at the beginning happen. And when it does, when something like this is reported, we tend to think, oh, what a scandal. Oh, this is an exception. And it is good that the press is reporting about this because now we know and now something will change. But let me tell you, as you can guess from the other snippets, this is not an exception. This is the way they, in which data work is structured around the world. It is not um, just a random coincidence that these, work, that these workers are to be found in very poor regions of the world. Um, in this case, the requesters, they take advantage, they take advantage of those, uh, of the situations in which these workers are to, uh, not, not only to pay miserable salaries and increase revenue in a way, uh, but also to let them do the work that nobody wants to do. Um, and the irony here, as in this case with ChatGPT, is that in many cases, this is done in the name of creating safer, uh, uh, AI systems, systems that are free of toxicity and bias. But for us um, users to enjoy that ChatGPT, uh, for example, that is not at least not openly toxic, uh, there had to be a bunch of workers, many workers in Kenya who had to suffer. And I think that is important to call out and to bring up um, every time we have a chance. So, as I said before, labor should become a central dimension in AI ethics. There is no bias mitigation possible because by data is always biased. It's, it's always biased, as we have seen before. It contains, in the sense that it contains the, 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 um, the, the worldviews of the, of the requesters. It is shaped by the problem formulation that is behind each model. Um, so data is always biased, aiming at mitigating that is, is an impossible task or a seductive distraction. Uh, instead, we should be discussing the powers, the power differentials that shape AI. Um, and we will never understand, as I said before, the political, the, we will never understand, fully understand AI technologies if we don't talk about the political economy and the labor relations that uh, are behind them. Just as there is no AI without data, there is no AI without data workers, and there is no ethical AI without ethical data work. So those are my principles, um, but I am fully aware that talking or appealing to um, the well-being of data workers somewhere in Kenya or in Syria or in Argentina or in Venezuela for that matter, I will not be winning the hearts and minds of uh, the people who really have a say uh, in this industry. I cannot go to Elon Musk and tell him, please, please, be a decent human being, please care about the workers, or, um, yeah, prioritize quality over scale. I can, this is not an argument. 
So for, for people like him and many others, I think that we, as I consider us to be part of the AI uh, ethics or AI justice and adjacent field communities, um, I think we need to appeal for what to what these people really care about, and that is money, speed, speed and scale. And this is why it's important that we discuss the relationship, and this is why I wanted to brainstorm with you, just uh, going into the discussion uh, part of this talk, uh, to brainstorm with you the relationship between uh, labor conditions and data quality and therefore the therefore model performance. So let us talk about data quality, or let us brainstorm about data quality. I will just bring a couple of examples, and then I think this is, will be brief, uh, and then we move. So the first thing that I wanted to show you, I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, back in May, there was a, a leaked uh, Google memo that was in the press. Well, if you don't know this, um, I can share the link later. There's a link on the slide. Um, so it was a, a leaked memo from Google that contained very interesting information about many things. And among the interesting things that were, um, that were uh, exposed there, there's this. And this is important, I think, because it says that data quality is what it's what's making the difference right now. And this is not me just hoping that this is the case. This is Google saying this. So imagine. Um, and this is important because this is an important shift from the internet scale garbage dump data sets that have run the show for so long until now. In here, it says that training on small, highly curated data sets could make the difference. And this is also important for data work because this is where I think the data workers could shine and could help us. Oh, this looks very bad. I hope you can read it. If not, I can read it aloud. Um, this is where the workers, where the data workers could shine. This is where we could leverage the expertise of data workers to help us surface concerns um, early on in the process. Um, because the problem is not that these data workers don't have an expertise or they don't know the data or they don't have concerns. The problem is that they are not listened to because the system is designed not to listen to them. The system is designed to think of them as tools, as proxies of the requesters, but not as thinking human beings who have their own concerns. So what you see now on the slide very quickly is, um, is a, an exercise that we did with a group of data laborers in Syria and we also invited some of the requesters. Those are those were um, um, professors, so researchers at the Scandinavian University. Those were the requesters. So we put together both groups in one room, and we asked them to role play each other. So the, lab the requesters needed to role play the laborers and vice versa. The task consisted in the machine learning practitioners, the requesters role-playing the labelers needed to come up with question cards, the yellow ones, um, and needed to add the things that they thought that the group that they were role-playing, so the labelers, needed to know in order to do their work, To what information do they need to do their work. And they came up with things like, okay, they need to know about labeling type, edge cases, of course, annotation precision, goal, classes for labeling, and that's all fine, that sounds good. We asked, the, in the end of the session, we asked the actual laborers in the room to rate how they thought they had been role playing. And they said, yes, this is all fine, this, we, we need to know all these things, but there are two things that we need to know even before starting a project that has both to, has an impact in both the, how we do our work, but also on the data quality or the quality that we will be able to provide because it has, it has an impact on the time that we will spend with the task. So the first one was, of course, about money. How much will I get for this task? Nobody thought of that this would be important. Probably the requester thought, well, this is going to be cheaper, cheaper cheap anyway. Um, so nobody thought that it was important to tell these workers beforehand how much they would earn. And the second thing, and this is the part that is interesting, was about ethics. And I remember the silence in the, or the moment in the room that was like, like an aha moment from the requesters, because of course, and I don't blame them, they, they are nice people, but and probably I would think the same way if I hadn't worked with data workers for the past five years. We don't think of, of these workers as someone who may have ethical concerns that could help us improve the data. 
of or things or anticipate the issues early on in the process. We don't think of them like that. So the question very quickly was, what are the implications of this data? And they elaborated and they told us two things. The first thing was they wanted to know what are the implications of this data in terms of who are the data subjects? Do we have consent? Where does this data come from? Also, what is going to be trained on this data? What kind of uh, AI product? Who will be the communities impacted by this product? And they also wanted to know another uh, thing in terms of what are the implications of this data? And that was, what are the implications of this data to me as a worker? What am I going to find when I open the first file? Am I going to be confronted with things that make me uncomfortable? Am I going to be confronted with nudity, with sexual uh, interaction, with abuse, with blood, with murder, with uh, violence, hate speech, and whatnot? If so, I want to know it in advance. I want to be able to choose whether I want to do this and not or not, because the content will determine, and also the money or the interaction of both, will determine how much time I, want, I will want to spend with this data. And I feel this example illustrates very well how both the ethical uh, part of it and the data quality part of it intertwine uh, in a way, entangled, are entangled in a way. Um, but if we don't ask the workers, probably we will never know about this. Second example, and last one. Um, I know this is very hard to look at. Um, uh, this is a low fidelity prototype and it's very hard to look at on a, on a slide, but I wanted to be true to the original. This is an original that we designed with data workers in uh, Argentina and I wanted to uh, show you that. So what we did here is uh, we focused on how data workers could, could participate in the co-creation of task instructions to help us, again, flag issues early on in the process tell us if something, if they believe that something uh, between the data and the labels wouldn't work um, or the categories wouldn't work. So what you see here is what the workers already see in any interface that they interact with. There is a space for the task instructions that is more or less a PDF that looks like this. So what the workers wanted to add is a space for comments. They wanted to be able to add comments and they thought this was important and they thought this would um, help the requester cut costs and save time because what is done right now, this is very common that the requesters post a task midway they realize that there's something wrong or they are not getting the data that they expected. They pulled it out, redo it and so on. So the workers said, hey, we can help with that. We can help signalize things that we feel that don't work. We can, uh, we also want a space to ask questions and so on. So this is what they imagined this could look like. But also, of course, they didn't want this to be a performative act of they receiving a space to for participation and then nothing happened. So of course they expected the requester to ed edit the instructions according according to the comment to the workers' comment. But again, what is very common when a, a worker takes out a task or regrets a task or changes a task is that in many cases the requester doesn't want to pay for the work that was was done on previous iterations on previous um, uh, under previous instructions or how the instructions look like before. So the workers wanted to have a space in which they could hold the requester accountable. And this is why they thought they wanted to have this change log here uh, to preserve um, different, like, the, the different versions of the instructions and how the instructions and the comments had evolved uh, with time. And this is a very simple thing. I'm not saying, oh, well, we we found something very unique here. But let me tell you, this would change so much for the workers. And I think it could help uh, us create better data sets in a way. Um, because again, the problem is that these workers, not that they don't have the expertise or the, or the, or the thoughts, they're just not given the, the chance to express those. Um, and this is important because research has actually shown that uh, being an expert in data is not just about formal education or studying something related to, I don't know, data science, for example. Uh, it is also about the craft of working with the data day in, day out. It is about uh, having a situated knowledge of your data, uh, a feel for that data that you only acquire when you are working with the data all the time. And this research, this paper specifically is about data scientists, but I think that this could apply to data workers too, uh, because who knows better the data than these workers who are all the time in contact with this data, who in many cases have created the data with their own bodies, in, in, in cases in which the data is literally selfish of them. 
So who knows this data better than them? Um, the problem is, again, they are not considered experts. And because also, if you consider a worker an expert and no, not a low-skilled worker, then you need to pay them accordingly. And this is the thing. It is not that the industry doesn't know that these workers would help. It's just that it's cheaper to keep them as low-skilled workers. But in fact, research, keep on referring to research in very, uh, 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 what's the word for that, like in a very um, impersonal way, yeah, abstract way. Research has, well, you have the snippets here to, to know what kind of research I'm referring to. Research has also shown that there is a, a positive correlation between better payment, more autonomy, uh, and ownership, and better data. There's three papers here, not to say research. Uh, specifically these three papers, but there are many more. Um, and also, the last two studies, they show also that the liberation can increase, um, can increase answers, uh, answer accuracy. Here, the work of Laura Arroyo uh, is, has, all her work has been about preserving moments of dissent, not just looking for consensus, but the importance for data quality of dissent, of, in, of opinions that are contrary to, another, to one another, and preserving that, measuring those, and using that to improve data sets. And this, again, relates to what I showed you before about preserving moments of dissent here, not just to hold the clients accountable, but for workers to have, uh, or for everyone to have a, a registry of what, what were the, the things that nobody or that not everyone agreed with or how agreement was reached and so on. Okay, I think, yes, I think we are, I'm done. So takeaways, summarizing very quickly. Um, data workers are the few, oh, I probably did that too. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, data pro uh, workers are the fuel that powers AI technologies. There is no AI without data, and as I said before, there is no ethical AI if we care about ethical AI or are, are working on that space. There is no ethical AI without AI uh, without uh, ethical data work. Um, but what has happened so far is that the AI industry has prioritized uh, quantity and scalability over quality, which costs uh, many of the labor conditions that we see today on data work has caused precarization, uh, surveillance, uh, and this search for uh, standardization that is to be seen on things like the interfaces that are used or the task instructions. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> so I thought I had my animations. <laughs> um, so there is, uh, again, there is no ethical AI without ethical data work. And finally, this is not just a matter of uh, being ethical and being good people. This is what I want to highlight. This is about also creating be better data uh, because I'm enabling avenues for data workers to express concerns, to use their expertise in data. It can also help us improve the quality of, our, of uh, the data sets, empowering data workers, leveraging their expertise, can help us again produce data sets, but most importantly, it can help us produce better and hopefully more just systems. And with that, I say thank you. Thanks a lot to Milagros Micheli for this wonderful talk. Uh, it's time for discussion now. So we have a few people connected remotely and uh, we'll also read their, uh, their questions. Do you have uh, any questions? Otherwise, I will start with, with one. Yeah, I, I have one, if I may. Uh, what, uh, do you know if um, the companies uh, that give uh, the words you have described uh, make any research about the categories uh, uh, that are meaningful not to the people that we use, not the artificial intelligence, no, because you showed us the example in which there were you know, uh, Americans, uh, South Americans, uh, etc. Do you think such categories 
are theirs because uh, yeah, they haven't thought about you know, the differences that there are between people or they get done research. Because in my opinion, uh, the way of thinking and of seeing things of the data workers may not be meaningful in the process in the sense that uh, if the AI is used by, I don't know, North American people, they, they may not care of the fact that uh, South Americans have other categories, not to categorize the world, no? because uh, they care for their vision of the world. As you said before, they give a job, people are paid to do that, so they have to accept that they are working to feed the vision of the world of the people. Who are giving them a job. Mm -hmm. no? But if it is the case that uh, you know, the employers don't care at all of the vision of the world, of the people who are going to use artificial intelligence, then it's a problem, of course. That's, that's exactly the problem. Um, so it is not that they don't realize that it would be better to include other visions. They're stupid. They, they are many things, but they are not stupid. So. Um, it is not that they don't realize that. It is a, a, prioritized, a matter of, of priorities. So let me give you an example to, to, to illustrate this. I was asked uh, recently, I think it was one month ago, to sit on a round of experts by one of these big tech companies in which they would just show, them, show, show us their latest product or the product that is in the pipeline. They will tell us, well, what do you think? The question that they had was, this product work, works very well for English speakers in the US. How do we scale? Because we are a global company and we, of course, this is not just, nowadays, no one of these technologies are just applied to one uh, country or one uh, segment of the population in a country. They are globally distributed. So um, I was like, oh, this is my chance. and I came out with all this pitch of how the workers can be experts on the data and they can help you and, and this is good and you would need uh, experts here and there and data workers. And what they told me was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, but actually we did that in the US and we did that for English to perfect this in English and it worked very well. So yeah, that's a great idea. But actually for the rest of the world, we don't have the budget to do that, to, do the same, to go through the same project. So we were hoping to optimize. And I was like, well, you know, okay, do that, but then you will never have the same quality of your product in the way it works in the US for English speakers as it would work in different countries and in different languages and different cultural contexts. So it is, again, about the money. It is about the search for scalability and, and again, a prioritization of scalability in terms, in, instead of quality. Um, the other question that one could pose, and this is again a question for everyone, is okay, if they are, even if they were worried to make it work in their own country, in their own cultural context, and in their own setup, which is a completely valid uh, type of concern and completely valid priority, then why not looking for workers who speak the language, for example? This is the right? idea. So, so why, why, why send this to? Venezuelans or Argentine people who barely speak English, because really we are talking in, in Latin America, it's not very common that you speak English fluently, uh, especially people who come from, uh, from poor backgrounds. So why doing that? Even if we are thinking of, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, okay, prioritizing that. This is very counter, counterintuitive to me. Um, yeah. yeah. To me. I don't, I don't, I don't have a clear answer to that. Just, um, I don't know, brainstorming and on thought. I think there's a question. I have a question which is um, related to you. So, first of all, I was quite impressed by the empirical research that you realized. So, uh, thank you. It was very interesting. And uh, um, my my research is about open science policies and mm -hmm. of the European interest. And a huge part of, of these policies related to research data. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I spent a, a lot of time, a lot of time reading tons of papers about uh, the fair principles, uh, so technical, uh, um, let's say, principles, technical rules to manage data in order to have uh, 
accurate data set. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm thinking uh, after your presentation, I'm quite, uh, I mean, I'm challenging my previous uh, <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. Rest, which is important, so thank you. Um, I was curious about uh, the, um, the interaction, I don't know, this is what I, I was wondering, if you had the, some interactions with companies or universities or research centers, um, not just uh, like uh, taking part of the meetings, but also as a, a real member of a project. Um, you mentioned at some point Scandinavian professors, and so I was uh, curious about that because I mean, if there is, uh, and some research, some papers you showed, uh, met, uh, show it, uh, if there is a, 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 an advantage, uh, if, if you consider that the, the safeguards of these big workers, why don't try to, I mean, if uh, institutions are not able to change the situation, why don't you try to, I don't know, to find a solution from another uh, perspective? Like, so, like, a bit confused, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a very good question. I don't have this, I don't have a clear answer to that one because it's, that's the million, the billion dollar question nowadays. Why not? My only explanation is it's a matter of cost and it's a prioritization of, uh, prioritization of costs uh, over quality. Um, I've been now answering in more depth to your question. I've been, for example, this Scandinavia University, when we did that exercise, they left the room thinking, wow, we've learned something today. It is important to involve these workers. And then we sat on a negotiation because, of course, involving the workers and allowing participation shouldn't mean more exploitation, shouldn't mean giving the workers more work and not paying them more. So then I sat with them in a, in, in, in a negotiation of salaries um, as a representative of the or advocating for the workers. Um, and that is where the difficulty came because the good intention was there. This is good. The workers want to do this and this is good for the data and we can... Um, and, and this is good for us, this would be a good learning uh, curve for our PhD students even. Um, but then when the, the, the bill comes, when the costs uh, are discussed, that's when the problem comes. So that's one example that I have to give. The other example is um, I was in contact with an organization in Argentina that is an observatory of gender um, of gender, how to translate this, uh, of gender issues and AI. Uh, this is a non-profit organization and they were creating a data set that um, was for different purposes, but in which they needed labels to consider, uh, to be sensitive to not just the binary male and female, but to be sensitive to other genders. And for that, they ask uh, people who were transgender and non-binary people to participate in the labeling process. They paid them accordingly, but they needed to ask for extra funding from that and they needed some organization respecting um, or advocating for the rights of queer people to really put money on that because otherwise um, this wouldn't happen. And this happened as a, I don't know, as a, uh, yeah, as a, as a kind of example project that would be shown as, okay, well, this works. And they were very happy with the results. They were very happy with the discussions that they had because this not only included this type of imposition, this included, um, you know, discussions and deliberation around the, the quality of the data. And of course, this improved the quality. At least uh, they were very happy with the results and the quality of the data that they were able uh, to produce. Um, but again, it takes money, it takes time. On the other hand, I have to say, because this is what they will always say, right? And when they, by day and in the industry, they will tell you, well, this is all very nice and well thought, but it costs money. And sure. um, yeah, why, why to do that? Um, I have to say that in my observation and that of many colleagues, the ways in which data work is structured right now, it's also not optimized. And it also costs a lot of money for things that could be flagged from, the er from early on in the process. Like, again, this case in which uh, the tasks get pulled out because the requesters, they can they only find out that there's issue with the data one that once they have uh, received the first batch of the data set. Uh, that's also not an optimum uh, process to do, and that also costs money and costs time. Costs time. So um, 
having, again, leveraging, I'm not saying, okay, this is just a matter of enabling participation and let workers do what they want. It is a matter of leveraging their expertise and letting them participate in very key moments of, data set pro of the data set production pipeline. Um, yeah, I don't have the answer. Yes, 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 very clear. Well, I, I, just to precise an aspect, I, I, I can see why a company you know, don't want to lose money, but I mean, from another perspective, if I'm a research center, a public research center at university, it was quite um, weird to me uh, losing the perspective. I mean, uh, the first interest is to produce uh, an accurate research with accurate data and uh, have a, I don't know, artificial intelligence system which is able to uh, be m more accurate as possible. So uh, just uh, moving the perspective from private to public, uh, I was losing uh, the... That's, that's uh, also a great, uh, a great point in the sense that that brings us to, a, to a, in, an even deeper discussion. And that is the question of what's accuracy and, um, and what, is, what kind of research is objective or not, because the belief, I mean, the, in the search for accuracy and the search for unbiased whatever type of data sets is that these instructions are structured in the way that they are. Because the belief is, okay, there is data and data speaks about an absolute truth and everything that is a distortion from that, that truth is biased. Whereas other schools of thought, among them STS, for example, Science and Technology Studies, or sociology in general could tell you, well, data as uh, in the book, Data Feminism, there's a quote called, data is the product of unequal social relations. And that is, and that's, and, and what is meant by that is that data is never one absolute truth. One data is the truth that is imposed through power relations, um, but it's only one truth over other possible. And, and acknowledging that it leads us to think the data can never be free of data, of, of bias. Data is always biased because it always encodes the preferences of those with more power. I mean, as researchers, let's just get out of the technology talk. As researchers who have done any type of research work, no matter what kind of uh, your discipline is, we all know that in each research project, there is uh, someone who decides What's the research question? What's the sample? Uh, if we are going qualitative or quantitative, um, what's the method and, and what are the questions that we want to ask? And we also know that those questions have, will have a decisive impact in the data that we will be able to collect, but also in the knowledge that we will produce. And also we know that the person making those defining decisions is generally the person with more power. It's never the research assistant or the student. It's always the professor, it's always the PI, which is not a bad thing. Someone needs to make those decisions. It's all fine. But then let's not pretend that the knowledge that we produce is somehow objective. Um, yeah. Someone else wants to intervene? Uh, yes, okay. a couple of questions. Um, this is one is uh, more of curiosity and uh, well, I'm, the old talk is really interesting and in that uh, um, all the situation that you described uh, was related with the, the digital phase of the imperialism and so that the geopolitics of the relationship between uh, between states and between uh, corporations and uh, this is all uh, the AI systems uh, or the AI industry is a perfect environment for a, but a more aggressive um, capitalism and exploitation, I think, about uh, all workers. And um, so my curiosity from this point of view uh, is related uh, to the fact uh, that uh, if there are some experience of unionization, for example, and um, so that if maybe in some part of the world, uh, um, some work has started with uh, um, making a collective uh, fighting, and I know that it's really difficult because uh, there is a 
great fragmentation with the dam, so it's not so easy to coordinate. Yeah. And so the, the second question is more related to the data quality part. And um, I think that uh, all of this uh, evidence uh, support the fact that uh, there is so no, no great interest in, uh, in data quality. So, for example, the fact that um, the, task, the task instruction and uh, um, the, the fact that they would uh, they ask to workers to label each speech, but the fact that each speech is a cultural, uh, it's obviously a cultural, uh, a cultural phase. Uh, Make uh, it uh, really difficult to have very good data quality on this, uh, for, for these requirements. And I think that the problem is related to the fact that there is no <coughs> very real enforcement on safety requirements mm -hmm. which want to be from the outcomes. And um, obviously, the, the categorization, uh, I think that it is a form of violence, uh, and uh, is, uh, I think that everyone in the in that work in this context uh, should uh, recognize it. Um, well, uh, I agree with the, the, techno the, the fact that the, the, um, uh, the technical tricks are not the, the solution. Uh, so the, the bias mitigation is not enough. Uh, and probably for some problems, the banning <laughs> remains the best solution mm -hmm. because there is no way to make them uh, to obtain some fair results, but uh, there are some uh, way in which uh, which are the tools that uh, uh, technicians or researchers uh, could uh, could have to produce systems with maybe more fair outcomes. So, which can be the, the direction of some technical improvements in the AI pipeline in order to uh, maybe fight in those of these uh, power asymmetries and also to obtain more fair results in the outcomes of the AI system. And finally, the last one is uh, the... Um, uh, you said that uh, the train on small created data could be better, and obviously I, I agree with that, but uh, maybe from this point of view, the widespread of the synthetic, synthetic data generation uh, techniques could be a solution from this point of view, could be helpful. Um. These are great, great questions. Um, actually, I hope I will remember all of them. If not, I will ask you to look at um, No, but these are great questions. Uh, did I get it right that you're a computer scientist? Are you sure you're a computer yeah. scientist? <laughs> this, is, this is an amazing question. Right? This is an next one. Ah, that's, that's, that's it. OK, uh, amazing questions. Thank you. Um, I think I want to start with the second in terms of what can be done. I think that's the gist of it, right? Like, what can be done? Um, there is a lot that can be done, and I'm not, I probably will not, I, I don't want to be here, the preacher, and tell you, well, you should be doing this, this, and that, because that I wouldn't be doing better than the ones who have convinced us that they know what we need. So I think what could be done better is to really think in terms of what are the technologies that serve us? Not just accept the technologies that are given to us, because the technologies that are given to us are just guided by standardization and scale. So whatever works in the US, as we said before, doesn't necessarily work in Italy or in Argentina or um, in Germany where I live. So it's really, let's think what serves us and let's try to orient our, um, our efforts towards that. And, and I know it sounds super difficult, and I know that that this sounds like, okay, let's fight these giant uh, technology concerns and um, uh, conglomerates and, um, and, and, and compete with them. We don't need to. We just need to create technologies that serve us, and we have the knowledge to do that. You're an engineer. You, you can be creating that. And I know that this comes with... Um, with the need for funding and with the need for money and with the, the expertise in a way. But still, we need to get creative in terms of, you know, what kind of technologies do we need and how to get there. And start from the communities that we want to, or with the people that we feel that we are in community with, whoever you feel that's your community. Gather, do things. They are 
examples of, you know, I don't know, uh, I was happy to hear that yesterday a group called Queer and AI uh, got Best Paper Award at FACT. I don't know if you follow FACT, but um, these initiatives, these, these are the things that we need. It is possible to gather with people who feel and think like us and create better things. Um, participation is, is key here, just as we demand participation in democratic and, and political processes, we should ask for participation in, in the creation of these systems. And we should also educate the future generations. I have kids, I don't know if other people in the room have kids, but to me it's super important that my kids are able to not only to operate TikTok, but to know how TikTok is constructed. And I think that's super important for future generations because only then, only with knowledge, we can fight and we can um, yeah, contradict some of the things that are given to us as given, as something that is absolute truth and, and this is the way it is. So um, I think that's, that's, that's key, really education for future generations. Uh, luckily you're an engineer, you have the education. So, um, but uh, really thinking in terms of who is, who is your community and what kind of technologies to serve you and your community. Um, and I think that's, that's key. That brings me to the first question that is about organizing, uh, which is my favorite question because I, there's nothing that I love to talk about <laughs> the most uh, than uh, workers organizing. Um, workers are, are organizing. There are different initiatives around the world. The best known is uh, Turcopticon uh, in the US. Um, that's been going on for a while, started as an organization, I don't know if you know it, it's an organization that um, groups uh, the workers with Amazon Mechanical Turk, and it's called Turk, Turk Opticon. Um, and they uh, organize around campaigns, like for example, fighting against massive rejection, that's the case when, work, when um, requesters pull out the task and they don't want to pay for the work that's been done. Um, they are expanding not only to include workers in the US, of course, the mass of mechanical Turk workers are in the US, but they are expanding to other to other uh, places, looking for organizing in other places, organizers in other places of the world. Yesterday, they were invited by my colleague, Alexana, to the stage on uh, at FACT. This uh, FACT is the, the, the biggest uh, conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency in the world. They were invited at the stage and they, uh, it was Alex's um, keynote, and she decided to share that with the, the two Hopscon workers. And they, I, I think that was great. That was that was uh, something beautiful to watch. Um, I think that when we talk about organizing workers, organizing an organization in general, it is great that we have. You you were right. You mentioned something that is that is correct that it is hard for these workers to organize because of the fact that they are physically distributed. Um, it is not just like the other platform workers, like, I don't know, the liver workers or Uber workers who just gather in the corner and they could organize if they wanted. Um, but these workers, they don't know each other. They work for a platform, they don't see each other unless they work for a company like Sama in which they see each other and then they organize what's happened with Sama and they suffer retaliation uh, from the company and they get fired. But I think that one thing that is important to consider in terms of workers organizing is are the local specificities, especially because this work happens in different places of the world with different uh, types of, um, of needs and grievances and context. And what is important for the, Turk, for the enter workers in the US might not be important for the workers in Syria. Um, so I think transnational solidarity is super important and is required not only from data workers to data workers, but also from tech workers to data workers too. So transnational solidarity needs to happen, otherwise this will not work. But we don't need, but that shouldn't mean uh, co-opting the concern, the specific concerns of specific uh, groups of workers. Um, so for example, one project that I'm working on is sharing learnings from workers organizing in a place to other workers, but then seeing what the workers in the second place choose to do with that knowledge. If that's useful or not, or if they choose to Im implement that in a different way, um, which is valid. Uh, yeah. 
in Argentina, sorry, last, last example, in Argentina, for example, um, as I was there doing field work, that was 2019, um, the workers were freelancers, like they were paid by the task, just for peace, piecemeal type of uh, payment. Um, and they started fighting for, uh, to be employees, to be hired by the company. It was a company very similar to Sama, as I said before. Um, so to, they started uh, organizing and fighting for that. And I, it was beautiful to witness how they achieved that goal of being hired by the company. Of course, that was not the holy solution because then they were hired and the law indicates that they can earn um, the minimum wage. And in Argentina, minimum wage leaves you under the poverty line in a country that uh, this year had 89% uh, inflation. So it is not the holy grail of solutions, but it is what the workers wanted and they managed to get that through organizing. So that's, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Something about, uh, this is a bit different from the main topic of this, but probably the, you talked a lot about you know, work as uh, solutions, transnational solidarity, maybe unionization, strikes, uh, even, and so on. But I find that uh, data workers are not the only one who are involved uh, in creating that which we use. And this is uh, a motto of the internet today, which is if something is free, it means you are a product. So it's not just the workers who produce all this information and all this data which makes things function, but also users themselves. This is the role of data and early access mm -hmm. we found them everywhere. Open AI and such a TV start with as beta and open access. So they could say, yeah, you know, this product sucks, but it's in beta, you know, it will, be, it will get better. Yeah. With your help, it will get better. Yeah. And this also it was something that uh, caused the uh, closure of open uh, GPT in Italy because they used that uh, in uh, an incorrect way, in an illicit way, the, the data which was gathered from the users. A uh, quick research, uh, uh, just to, to give a couple of numbers, just, just going on Reddit, on the biggest forum online, ChatGPT is subreddit as 2 million members. Mm -hmm. So everyone uh, could, could, could have 2 million workers, free workers, yes. which share their opinions, their views, and everything. Uh, one, one, one example regarding this was a couple of months ago, or maybe more than a couple of months ago, at the beginning, at the early stages of ChatGPT, there was this jailbreak, they called it, uh, which uh, basically allowed the ChatGPT to say something, some things that were not, uh, it, that it was not meant to say according to OpenAI's guidelines. It was based in uh, like a week, mm -hmm. and it was discovered because everyone on the subreddit and everywhere else on the internet, the free users, not paid workers, even if they pay uh, under paid workers, but free workers, were, were uh, telling each other how to jailbreak ChatGPT, what were, and so it was easy to fix and it was easy, as they say, to lobotomize it and to even more uh, keep it within the boundaries mm -hmm. of OpenAI. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on this? Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's true what you said. There are workers who are underpaid, that there are places in the world where this is better than nothing and so it's a forced choice. But even here in Italy or in the first world, uh, we are workers ourselves. Absolutely. And we don't get paid nothing. So Absolutely. it's even worse, probably. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think the, I don't know, I would not put it in worse or, 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 yeah, or right. better because, you know, like, uh, so know, when you, yeah, there's many things to consider. And in the end, if you need this work to pay your bills or to feed your kids, then I don't know, it has a course. Um, but this is absolutely true, and I was talking about this about the, when I brought that example. I think I said it right: the uh, the recapture quizzes, or you know, again, every time you're asked by ChatGPT, was that useful to rate it? Like this is, and and what your uh, the jailbreak example that you're that you're just uh, mentioning. These are massive examples of something that happens every day, and we don't talk about that that much. Um, I am just a person. So I don't have the capacity to do research uh, specifically on the role of um, of uh, users as data workers. But I think there's there's colleagues, of course, and Antonio Casidi is one of them who's starting to look into this or who has been talking about this for years now. Um, I think this is something that needs to be discussed more because 
because of the uh, also the many ah oh, someone is uh, thanks Mariano. okay sorry I thought there was a question in the chat um, thanks my Mauricio um, uh, what was I saying uh, because oh yeah that's in many cases there are gamification elements that makes us think that this is a fun thing to do this is just the same thing in data work in many many of the many of the tasks and many of the platforms are um, are designed in such a way that they contain gamification elements that that give the workers the feeling that they are participating participating in something that is that is fun. Especially now in this project that I'm starting in Europe, in which uh, we are seeing what's the difference between these highly precarized, highly um, uh, poor people in uh, the global south and European micro workers. Um, what's the difference between them? For them, for the micro workers in Europe, there are many who do this out of need, and there are, but there are also um, many who do this as a part-time job or something that they do whenever they have 20 minutes uh, left. Um, and for them, this fun element, this feeling of, I will solve this quiz, I will solve this challenge, that's important. But what is not, as you said, this is not discussed, um, who is getting profit out of this, who is getting rich, what kind of multi-billion, uh, multi-billion dollar industry we are feeding with our fun. Um, and that's absolutely true. So yeah, I mean, if someone wants to do research on this in the room, I'm, I mean, I can collaborate. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I thought you wanted to say something. Yeah, you have I don't know if I have a question, but I was thinking about the, uh, the fact that the, the, for instance, I'm working, uh, let's say, on the side of the guys of administrating the, the, the task in certain situations. Actually, all the kind of uh, machine learning uh, training and all the this is done by an employee in Italy. So the situation is much different. But I, I was wondering, uh, where do we set the appropriate level for a certain kind of uh, uh, for instance, the com com compensation thresholds uh, which should become ethical. For instance, if I'm paying a, a worker the double of the average uh, pay for a similarly, similarly qualified worker in a poor country, I'm still paying it less than uh, it's, uh, <laughs> his uh, work is worth by definition of why they don't pay him. So, I mean, how uh, can we define a, a, an ethical uh, work from, from this? Uh, Perspective, because uh, if uh, the fact that the worker is willing to participate and the fact of uh, respecting the law in the country is not enough, then uh, it's uh, it becomes interesting to identify at least some criteria which which would uh, let's say not guarantee but uh, be, be be used to assess the the, the the ethical quality of this, uh, uh, for instance, level of salary or or level of involvement because. Also, also the, the, the fact of uh, accepting the, the feedback uh, uh, may be something that you decide to add to your process then uh, in, in the interaction you described uh, with the Scandinavian scholars, uh, the outcome was uh, it will cost more. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that this is really needed in the sense that uh, you, you said that uh, the, the, the process was not uh, op 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 optimized uh, there was the possibility of creating a, an interaction, even if uh, the price of the individual task remained the same, it could be possible to improve uh, the experience of the worker and the experience of uh, the, the, say, the, 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 the buyer of uh, the, 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 the task without necessarily increasing the cost of the individual task. Uh, otherwise, it was true that the process was quite optimized considering the constraints. So, um, I, I wonder whether you can give us some, some more principal elements to, to uh, try to assess uh, this, uh, the, 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 the very relevant uh, to the respect of our ethical uh, acceptability. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a great great question. Um, at my institute, at the Weizmann, uh, one of my institutes, the Weizmann Institute I'm referring now, um, we are right now starting uh, a set of guidelines 
exactly to go through that. Because again, we are, I, I have requested data work from platforms too. We do this, um, and we are not bad people for doing that. Um, but we want to do this according to specific guidelines, and we want to do that according to ethical principles. And we need that because not everyone knows what someone is supposed to be earning or, or what is a, a, an acceptable salary somewhere else. That's, that's for sure true, so there is no bad intention here. So what I find useful is to create this type of guidelines uh, even within the, the, the specific organizations in which we work. We, as I said before, we are studying that at the Weizmann Institute right now. Um, and it's useful to think of that just as we think of um, of institutional review boards, like whenever we go and do research, we have to consult an institutional review board, and they would tell us things like things like, okay, well, if you want to conduct interviews, you need to pay them as much, uh, or you know, like in all cases, for me, for my colleague Julian, who was at the moment uh, at the time in in uh, Toronto University, what our institutional review board would tell us is, you need to pay your um, your interview partners. The, at least the minimum wage as in your country, not in their country, but in your country. Mm -hmm. wow. So, yes, yes, that's, uh, but that's the way it should be. So, you know, like, wh why would, wouldn't you do that? If you pay that workers in your country, then why not paying them uh, the same in well, Venezuela? Well, because they are not native speaker of your language, they do not have the same kind of background, so their work is worth less. So if you prefer, unless uh, you, you are people with a, a higher uh, background, uh, socialization, so on, in that case, uh, you indirectly pay them less. <laughs> but uh, still, so... I think, uh, I think there are two myths, uh, two very, very persistent myths around uh, fraud work or data work. And that is A, that these workers are low skill. In many cases, they have uh, uh, university degrees, they are very, very, very skillful. And again, if you need workers to speak your language, then hire them in your country. Don't go to Kenya to hire them. So I think that's, that would be the logical solution to this. Um, the, first, the first myth is that, that they are low skilled. They are not. In many cases, they are not. And the second, that they have to also to go through schooling to participate in the platforms. They have to go through training. This is this is really this is not just a, you know my father sitting in front of a computer that he cannot operate and just labor and stuff. This is really skilled uh, or people who prepare to do that kind of work if they are doing it professionally. And the second myth around crowd work is that, well, you know, paying less than two euros in Europe it wouldn't be acceptable. People people here. Less than or two euros is nothing here, but it is a lot of money in Kenya. Let me tell you, it's not. Two euros is nothing here, and it's nothing in Kenya, and it's nothing in Argentina. Paying that, it's just not acceptable. It's just not, yeah, it's not, uh, it's nothing that we, if we are thinking seriously of these issues, can really think about. That's the myth. Paying them, I can tell you, like from, with all the people that I have talked to, even if they have clients from San Francisco or Europe, that you will think, well, they pay them two euros and they are happy with the two euros. None of them was uh, able to make a dignified living out of this work. They could make ends meet. They would just be able to just, you know, bring some uh, low low quality food to the table. But they were not able to send their kids to university or, you know, again, get out of the slum or put you know, save money to do something else, or it, it was it was not changing their, uh, their the condition, their conditions of poverty. So, and I think that the purpose of working for all of us, not just for all of us in Europe and fancy, um, in a fancy institution, but also for workers in Kenya, should be to work not just to survive, but also to have a future and to improve and to you know. Uh, move forward and not just to again survive um, that shouldn't be the i think that's not my conception of, of work um yeah yes I have, uh, <clears throat> an actual question that i proposing. the question is uh, due to the fact that i'm not uh, well versed in, in this topic and so uh, forgive me if i ask a question you know, a sort of naive uh, question but I wonder whether you were talking about the training for the platform, platforms to have uh, 
to prepare workers to work on the platforms. So is this, is this purely self-regulated? So the training and the preparation they do for workers is just they do it independently. There is no oversight. I'm thinking, I think you know the case uh, where workers have to watch uh, potentially uh, heavy or psychologically damaging content, uh, and uh, I wonder whether they just entirely on their own decide uh, how to screen people uh, before showing them. Um, this content and for how often they have shown this potentially terrible content, uh, whether it's full time, whether it's partial, what do they do if people get damaged psychologically? Do they have any duties regarding the work here? So I'm wondering if there is any, any kind of uh, actual regulation, not self regulation, regarding this area, which I think uh, I've been reading superficially, but it's, uh, it's an important topic and where people can get scared uh, psychologically for a long time. And the second uh, topic you were talking about regulation at the advisory now, I wonder whether um, the ACM and IEEE as the major professional, uh, which in recent years have been a bit more sensitive to these topics, whether they, they cannot uh, adopt uh, more specific, uh, right now it's, it's pretty general, but they can adopt more specific guidelines exactly on this area and then demanding uh, people, uh, and it's certainly their members, but more broadly from other professionals to adhere to a higher uh, standards regarding data generating, data annotation, and gathering of um, Thank you for both questions, and those are both really, really good. Um, so I will start with the second. Yes, there is there are initiatives, uh, at least within, uh, within ACM, that's where I, I, I the community that I, I feel I belong more uh, most. Um, there's been a bunch of talk, but also initiatives that were originated also in papers um, that talk about these issues. For example, papers that would say, well, if we document, or, talking about documentation, but I think it is your topic, right? Uh, if we document things like um, when we document data sets, if we document uh, classes and attributes and we document um, the composition of the data sets is uh, just the uses, why not document how much the data workers were paid? Right. And why not agreeing on um, on how much they should be paid according to guidelines? There is a push towards that, I think, this year especially, and seeing what happened in fact this year, um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this will be done uh, mm -hmm. very soon that there will be guidelines and hopefully that will be of help for all of us because as uh, the colleague was saying we need those guidelines we just cannot guess what is right and what is wrong um i know these things because i'm working on this topic but it is i know don't know these things because i'm a genius and, so right. just, you know, and if you're not working on this then how could you know so um i think it is important to have some more guidelines but until we do i think it is important uh, also to, to think that from the very institutional context and talk to our public researchers and see what they are doing and so on and, and tell them what well, this is what other people are doing and this is what is done in other uh, types of research so why not apply the same principles. Um, so that was the second question and the first question was about uh, self-regulation from the if I understand you correctly, so you're asking if the companies or the platforms self-regulate in terms of the training and how to select workers, and, or if there is regulation. No, there is. Not. I mean, there might be specific regulations that apply in specific countries, but in general, there is not. This is purely self-regulated, and that is the problem. This is where all these cases, like Sama, uh, happen because these workers are. Um, this is not yet labeled as a hazardous type right. of work, like, I don't know, mining could be, you know, right. like, it's not labeled as that. Um, the training comes specifically from the uh, from the ultimate client, so in the, the case, Sama is not a client, it's just a proxy yeah. for Meta or for OpenAI, Sama, Sama workers were also doing content moderation for, um, for, for Meta, uh, in Germany and I think the rest of Europe, there's this company called Telos International that does content moderation for Meta too. Okay. And that company, they, the, the working conditions are just the same, same as I described in Kenya. These workers, uh, they work shifts, eight hour shifts, just like any of us, but the work consists of really watching these things happen and they will tell you things like whenever there is 
whenever we hear in the news uh, that there has been an earthquake or that there's been a terrorist attack, attack somewhere, um, we get into the office prepared to watch terrible imagery because that's people post stuff, post videos, post right. comments, and they need to moderate that. Um, they don't have any psychological support. Um, they have now they have implemented again all self-regulated, but the company, this company Telus, has implemented um, self-help groups. So groups of the workers just talking to oh, each other, sorry. but no, no really professional psychological support. One of the workers uh, even reported of a uh, of a um, colleague committing suicide. Um, and of course, someone committing suicide cannot just be attributed to the work, but the reality is that this worker has seek uh, professional help from the company in repeated, in repeated occasions, uh, manifesting that he was feeling very bad for things that he had to watch. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, okay. Because uh, since we're, there is a, a growing uh, uh, awareness, uh, for instance, in the case of mining, uh, mm -hmm. for mining for various kinds of materials and end up in digital devices. And there has been some effort uh, on part of Apple, maybe Samsung, uh, to, um, to be a bit more careful about uh, working conditions uh, of the mining companies that provide uh, some of the material that ends up in the components that they assemble. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's very much the same kind of uh, awareness that should also be employed uh, in the case of data workers. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that's part of the demands of the data workers, actually, that especially the content moderators. Okay, it's interesting, but in public discourse, and I've been researching this, in the public discourse, the thing about mining is somewhat is now getting a bit more yeah. attention, but um, much less uh, the, the, the talk about the, the data and data workers. Yeah, no, that's, that's part of the problem, yes. That's so. the example of ChatGPT or the pretty good coverage uh, of the, the words of I'm not saying that everybody knows about it, but I mean, a, a, a significant percentage of people working in this domain definitely know about the, the, the specific case. And in that case, if I find out other workers uh, working for with the some, of the, some, some of the case working for the GPT, and if I'm not mistaken, the final outcome after the both uh, beta and the uh, case is that some decided to exit from this business, if, I, if I'm not from the, or at least they declared that they were going to. So in, in, in a certain sense, uh, there is an impact also on, let's say, the, 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 the chain of firms uh, using this kind of uh, services uh, with uh, exceedingly low degree of care. So uh, since uh, I, I guess that the, the start is some, uh, some room also for uh, entrepreneurship in the sense of uh, taking advantage of this uh, increased level of attention and maybe providing Say services which are a bit more certified, a bit more uh, say accountable with respect to this uh, ch chain of uh, activity. Did you, did you see any specific case in, in which uh, some 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 firms are, are, are trying to advertise uh, or uh, certify their the, the capability of producing uh, ethical data workers, uh, data work business services? Just like Apple is trying yeah. to present itself yeah. uh, as a bit more ethical and, 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 and this yeah. happened after e tens of years uh, of uh, uh, leakage of uh, kids uh, in bonds uh, of uh, Mercury. So I mean, uh, it requires, unfortunately, a, a huge amount of suffering, mm -hmm. suffering and, and coverage from the media. But uh, it, it, in part, uh, the, the, the market slowly trying to address these things because the sensitivity of the final customers is getting higher. Yeah, um, I think there are two parts to your questions and, and uh, to the question I would try to address both. So the first thing is whether there is more visibility. In fact, there is. You said the case of Zama is well known. And this is also why I bring it up in this talk because I thought, okay, everyone saw that. Um, but again, that's just not, this, this, that's not an exception but the rule. This is, it's, it's the way really it's Sama. Now we know things have changed. Sama stopped working with OpenAI. Problem solved. What happens with all the other companies? They keep on working in the same way. So that's the first part. The second part is whether someone is advertising with that. I had that idea, I think it was 2020, as I was after my field work in Bulgaria, 
And I was having a very honest conversation with the founder of the company, and she was telling me, well, it is not that I don't want to improve the conditions, it is just that we don't have enough business and there is a race to the bottom um, that comes from the from the platforms who charge really, who pay peanuts, charge peanuts, and in the end, we, I cannot compete. So if I had more business, I would improve conditions. And I believed her, and my advice to her was exactly what she said, was like, well, there might be a race to the bottom, but there's also an opportunity here, and there's a, a niche in a, in a way, and that is ethical data work. And that is you advertising that you are providing your workers with ethical conditions, and therefore the quality of the data that you produce is is handled with care, it is better, it is more you know more carefully curated, and so on. And she did that, and it worked well. <laughs> So it was it was a good idea in the sense that it worked for her. We are talking about a very small company in this area, um, but she was able to attract customers who were actually looking for that. You know, who wanted to have this certify or this seal of quality of okay, well, we are not going to get a, a, a public outcry because we are uh, making our workers work under precarious conditions, and I want my data to be handled with more care. I want this to be done. Um, not fast, but or fast, yeah, but uh, more than fast, like really with care. And I want to have someone to talk to. I want to have a manager who is in charge of my project and uh, and who can manage the workers. And I always want to work with the same workers. Um, so those are many of the things that they advertised, and they were able to, yeah, to succeed in a way in a very small scale, but still. Uh, to, to find their own market for that time and time. So, yeah, that's a good idea. I think that it's... <laughs> time is over. Yes, exactly. You, 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 you can ask. No, 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 no. <laughs> so for now, let's thank again uh, Milagos Micheli for the talk. You and thank you, Thank you for the, for the great questions. Really, I, it was a very nice discussion. Thanks. Yeah.